Good morning. I'm going to turn off my cell phone here. Good morning to all of you. Well, we're having a white Sabbath. It's snowing outside. This is our first snow for the winter season. We haven't even started winter yet. We're still in the autumn. <coughs> now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the traditional season that we're getting into now because people do have questions about this. So this will be a Bible study. Feel free to interrupt me and ask questions if you'd like. Uh, but before we get into it, let's ask God's blessing on this service. Eternal God, God of Israel, we ask you now to bless and anoint not only the teaching, but all the many hundreds of people who will be hearing this either live or later on after this message is given. And we bless each one who is here today and, and guide and anoint all that is said in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the traditional season, December. We're in December now of gift exchanging and spending lots and lots of money. So that's something that we uh, have grown up with in this country and in most countries around the world, I would assume, where we uh, grow up with the idea of we're supposed to buy lots of gifts. Now I learned about the origin of Christmas back in when I was a teenager at the age of 14. But I studied it. I didn't fully grasp it. I didn't fully understand it until I was about 16. And, of course, all scholars agree. Now, this is interesting. If you can get a consensus of scholars, you're doing well. But all scholars agree. All scholars agree. Oh, you dropped something. Oh, yeah. I picked that up. I don't want to have them top of my head on camera. All scholars agree. <clears throat> And anytime you can get two scholars to agree on anything, you're doing well. But, but they all agree that December is not the month Jesus was born in. Now, people have told me, well, it, it, we just don't know when he was born, so we just picked a day. I hear that all the time. We don't know when he was born, so we picked a day. First of all, we didn't pick the day. Secondly, we do know when he was born. We don't know the exact day and hour, but we do know when he was born. He was born in either very late summer or very, very early autumn. Some scholars say it may have been as early as the 15th of September. Some say, most say it was around the last week of, of uh, September. Not in the middle of September, but maybe the last of September. But they don't think he was born uh, in, in mid to late October or November or, or any time. He could not have been born in December, which I'm not going to go into that because that's so well known. We all know that already. I don't know that all the viewers know that, but you can go to the Internet and look up Christmas Look up Saturnalia also, which was the 25th of December, when they worshipped the sun god, and, and, and they worshipped a god named Saturn and all this. So you can do your own research and find this out. But all scholars agree that December 25th is not the date of Jesus' birth, and that he was born in the autumn. All scholars that I know of, and I've read more than, I don't know, probably a couple of hundred, I've never run across one that said that he was born in December. Nobody says that. Absolutely nobody. Adam Clark commentary said that, that, that on the basis of one fact alone, the nativity in December should be given up on the fact that the, the shepherds were out sleeping in the fields at night. Now, look how cold it is out there. Would you, if you were a shepherd, would you out there and lay down out in the snow? You know, were the shepherds dreaming of a white Christmas out there in the laying down with their sheep? Now, it had to be warm weather. According to the Adam Clark commentary, which was written in the 1800s, and there are other commentaries today that will also verify this, the shepherds took their, their flocks in no later than the first day of October. Why? Because that was the beginning of the rainy season. Now, it's, it's really dumb to be sleeping out there in the snow to start with when you don't have to, but to be out there in the snow, the ice, the rain, and everything else, that's just crazy. That'd catch pneumonia. So they took the sheep in because there was nothing to graze. The sheep were out there in summertime and early autumn, and very, very early autumn, because there's still something out there that you can eat if you're a sheep. But then they took them in because, like right now, what, the, what would the sheep eat out there today? So, no, they were not uh, out there in December. It was probably mid to late September when the shepherds were out there. But now that's common knowledge. However, today, what I want to talk to you about is about this season how does a Christian relate to it? I, when people ask me, do you celebrate Christmas? I say, well, first of all, it's not the birthday of Jesus. They say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. 
I've had people that tell me it doesn't matter when you celebrate it as long as you do. I've heard, have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard it. It doesn't matter when you celebrate the birthday of Jesus as long as you do. But it also reminds me of the example that you give. What's that? About the man's ex-wife. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I hadn't thought to bring that up, but I will real quickly because I think maybe that should apply here. It does. It is applicable. Man gets married. Uh, well, this woman marries this guy, and and uh, he eventually dies. His birthday, let's say, is in December. Let's just say that his birthday is in December, and she always throws in a big surprise party every December. It's not really a surprise. And so she decorates the house and she does all these things. Well, eventually he dies and she's a widow and she gets remarried. And she marries a man whose birthday is nowhere near December, but she taught, she knows when his birthday is, but she passes up his birthday and, and he's expecting her to at least give him a card and she just does nothing. And so come December, she throws him a big surprise and it truly is a surprise party. He says, why are you celebrating my birthday now? Because my birthday was several months ago. Why are you waiting until now to celebrate it? Well, I know it's not your birthday, but I was in the habit of celebrating it with my first husband. And even though it's your birthday I'm celebrating, I'm going to do it at the same time when I celebrate my last husband's birthday. And, and every year when I mention this to, to our students here at Ambassador Christian College, I ask the ladies, uh, would they do that? Or ask the men. I say, how do you feel? If your wife did that, how would that make you feel? And I get 100% negative opinion. They don't like the idea that their wife would celebrate their first husband's birthday. Although, the lady says, no, no, I'm celebrating your birthday. I'm just doing it at the time when I celebrated my first husband's birthday. Well, the pagans celebrated the sun god's birthday in December at the winter solstice. And all the pagans celebrated the birthday of the sun god at the winter solstice. Ra, the Egyptian sun god, his birthday was December 25th. Baal, the Phoenician sun god, his birthday was at the winter solstice, December 25th on the old, old calendar. Uh, the Julian calendar, the winter solstice was the 25th. On our calendar, it's like the 23rd, I think. Winter solstice is the first day of winter when the, sun, when the days start getting longer. Right now, the days are still getting shorter. But on the winter solstice, the days start getting longer. And so... Uh, they thought, well, the sun is reborn, so this is like the sun's birthday. So we're worshiping the dumb sun in the sky, and we'll worship him uh, on the winter solstice. And so uh, the Babylonian sun god had a different name, Tammuz. And guess what? His birthday was December 25th. Mithras, the, uh, the Roman sun god, his birthday was December 25th. And on and on he goes. And so by the time... The early Catholic Church got going very, very well in Rome. By that time, there were still tens, hundreds of thousands of Italians and all over Europe celebrating December 25th. And they could, and they were, they were establishing what is called a universal church. The word universal is the word Catholic. And so they were trying to establish one great big church, but they couldn't get these pagans to give this up. Constantine even paid people thousands of dollars in gold to get them to get baptized. He spent he spent many, many thousands of dollars uh, of Roman tax money giving it to people if you'll get baptized and become a Catholic. But the thing is, these people who were not truly converted to Christ, who were now in the Catholic Church and, quote, Christian, refused to give up their holidays. They refused to give up their customs. They refused to give it all up. So they said, well, Let's just go ahead and let all these pagans keep these holidays, but we'll just give it some kind of Christian significance. Now, even at that time, they probably knew that Jesus was born in late summer or early autumn. However, they said, we'll just make December 25th the birthday of Christ. Let the pagans go ahead and celebrate. The Christians will join in with the pagans, and it will all be one big happy family. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, absolutely nothing if, if the Bible doesn't condemn that. So here's my question today. Does the Bible have anything to say about mixing heathen religion with true religion? Because the heathen religion is the religion of Satan, and the true religion is the religion of Jesus Christ. So is there anything wrong in mixing the two? Now, if you got your Bibles today, you might want to turn with me to some of these scriptures. 
2 Thessalonians 2.15. I told you this is going to be a Bible study, so feel free to ask questions if you'd like to today. <coughs> Second Thessalonians. People say, well, you know, it just doesn't make any difference. Of course it doesn't make, absolutely makes no difference at all to you. But does it make a difference to God? And if we're trying to please him, then don't, don't, don't tell me it doesn't make any difference to you. I don't care what you think. I don't care what your opinion is, and you don't care what my opinion is. What is God's opinion on these holidays? For Christians, now if you're a heathen, of course do whatever you want to do, because that's your privilege. But if you're a Christian, you have a higher responsibility. We have more accountability. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, uh, well, let me start in verse 14. Whereunto he, God, called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. First John 3, 2, we'll have a body like him one day. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught. But whose traditions? The traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle, our word, our spoken word, when you heard us preach, or by our epistle. So we're supposed to follow the traditions of the apostles' writings, not the writings of Rome or Babylon. Now right there, that one verse settles it. But let's read a few more. Look at chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians and verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things that we command you. Now if we transgress God's commandment, that's a sin. That's 1 John 3, 4, the definition of sin is to transgress, to go contrary to the law of God. Verse 6, now we command you, brethren. So this is not just a suggestion. This is a commandment. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother, every Christian, who walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us. The traditions that Christians are required to, to follow are the traditions which we received from the apostles. Not from the Roman Catholic Church and not from the Protestant Church, but from the early true Church of God with headquarters in Jerusalem, the early New Testament Church. We're required to follow their traditions. Verse 7, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. Don't follow Rome. Don't follow Martin Luther. Don't follow John Calvin or John Wesley or John Knox or some other John unless you find it in the Bible. Oh, you know, if I, I just happen to realize there might be somebody watching named John who might get offended by that. What I mean is, don't follow just anybody. Follow the traditions of the Bible. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We should follow what God said. Verse 9, not because we have not power to make ourselves an example to you to follow us. Now, did the Apostle Paul mix? Now, the winter, Saturday, the winter solstice existed in Paul's day. The winter solstice existed in Jesus' day. He knew about December 25th. It was a riotous celebration. And the ancient world had nothing to do with Jesus. Did Paul mix that riotous pagan heathen celebration with his faith in Jesus? Of course not. He says, you must follow us. They didn't do that, so we're to follow them. Even when we were with you, this we commanded you. And then he goes on to explain what he told him to do. Now, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word, not what the Pope says, our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him. Leave him alone. Don't mess with him. If he's not willing to obey this word. A few more scriptures. Let's go to Galatians. Uh, back up a few books to Galatians right after Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 14. For, for you have heard of my conversation, the King James says, the Greek says, the conduct, his conduct. On a nice cold winter day, it's good to have something hot to drink. You've heard of my conduct in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, the Jewish people, being more exceedingly zealous, notice, 
being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers, the traditions of the Jewish people who kept the Ten Commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. But never, to this day, Jews don't celebrate the 25th of December. They never did. And the early church never did. He was zealous of what traditions? The traditions of the heathen? No, the traditions of his fathers, of the Jewish people. Even though technically he was of the tribe of Benjamin, but the Jewish religion. In fact, when you see the term Jews religion, the Greek word there is Judaism, believe it or not. I want to go to 1 Peter, going back and forth here, in the general epistles here, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. Well, actually, I'll start with... Uh, I'm going to start with verse 16, 1 Peter 1, verse 16. It is written, be you holy, for I am holy, quoting God. And if you call on the Father, who without respect to persons, judges every man according to his work. Now, this word man, anthropos in Greek, means person, male or female. Verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, you weren't bought, redeemed means bought, you weren't bought with money from your vain conduct. What kind of vain conduct? Received by tradition from your fathers. Paul said, I was zealous of the tradition of my fathers, but you pagans, he's writing to these people scattered all over Pontus and Bithynia and that area. He says, you have received vain conduct by the tradition from your fathers. We're not supposed to follow the, tr the tradition of their fathers. We're supposed to follow the same traditions that Paul received from his fathers. You say, now where do you get that from? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Follow me as I follow Christ. The Greek word there is imitate. Be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1 says. <clears throat> So the tradition from your fathers is vain. He calls it vain conduct. We're not supposed to follow that. So why is it that, that the 99.9% .9 of all professing Christians follow the traditions of Rome rather than the Bible? Number one, a lot of it's ignorance. Number two, a lot of it is they just don't give a darn. To put it bluntly, they just don't care. God, keep your nose out of my religion. Don't mess with my religion. Don't mess with my pagan celebrations. Then you go to church on Sunday and say, oh, how I love Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, I love him, but I'm not going to do what he says. That's what pe that's how people's attitude. Now, a lot of it is because God has not called them to understanding. You can't condemn people that don't understand. I don't condemn anybody. I don't judge anybody. It's not my place. But here's the thing. I'm not judging anybody who's watching this or anybody who's here today, but what I am saying is this. God is going to judge you. And all I'm doing is making the announcement. I'm announcing to you. God's going to judge every one of us. And so we have to be careful what we're doing. You may say, oh, this is not important. It is to God or it wouldn't be in the Bible. Let me back up to uh, Colossians chapter 2. Paul condemned Greek philosophy. In fact, <clears throat> I've done uh, uh, some research into how the early Catholic Church brought into the early Catholic Church Greek philosophy from the philosopher Plato. And in the Middle Ages, I remember reading this in world history class uh, when I was in high school, that the Middle Ages, they were required to teach in the Catholic universities Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and Aristotle. They're required to teach that. And so the seminary graduates didn't just get the word of God. They got all this Greek philosophy. Now, in Colossae, they spoke Greek there. This was loaded with Greek philosophy. And in Colossians chapter 2, in verse 8, let's back up to verse 4. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Watch out for men. Verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That was the big thing going on at that time. And vain deceit. What kind of philosophy and deceit? After the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world. Worldliness and not after Christ. That's what we have to be careful about. Look at verse 20. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, and he says this in the book of Romans, you're dead with Christ, you're hidden with God, and so on. 
If you're dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? And that word can also be translated decrees. Man-made ordinances. How do you know it's man-made? Look at verse 22. After the commandments and doctrines of men. Those commandments of men are contrary to the commandments of God. Did you know that Christmas was not even a commanded celebration until the 5th century after Christ? In the 5th century, the Catholic Church issued a decree commanding all Catholics now to celebrate Christmas along with the pagans. The commandments and doctrines of men. Why are you subject to this? Don't be subject to these things. The Gentiles inherited a bunch of lies. Yes, sir? You can't even find Christmas in the Bible. That's right. Christmas is never mentioned anywhere in all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That's right. And the Bible says don't follow no fables or genealogies. That's right. That's what the Bible says. Don't follow those fables. Now, somebody is bound to misunderstand and say, wait a minute, I can find Christmas in the Bible. Luke chapter 2. That's not Christmas. That's, the, that's September. Christmas has always been in December. What does the word Christmas mean? Anybody know? Christ's mass. Protestants don't even have mass, but they'll make an exception for this. In the Catholic Church, they'd have a special mass for Christ at the time of the winter solstice, which is purely man-made. Now, you say, what's wrong with it? Well, nothing wrong with it unless God condemns it, and that's what we're going to look at here in a minute. Does God have anything to say about this? Well, that's what I ask them when they tell me about Christmas. I ask them, where is it at in my... Yeah, and they'll, in that, inevitably, they'll show you the wise men going to Bethlehem Zone or Jerusalem. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Christmas, the, 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 the Saturnalia celebration, which they now call Christmas, is not mentioned. In Jeremiah, there is a very, very important verse here in Jeremiah chapter 16 that I want to read to you. Um, I was waiting for that one. You were waiting for that one, huh? Mm -hmm. The Gentiles grew up in their Gentile religion. Bless their hearts, I'm a Gentile. But they grew up in their heathen Gentile religion. And so a lot of them, when they were forced by the emperor of Rome to become Catholic, they said, okay, okay, we'll do it, but we're not changing our religion. And there were so many hundreds of thousands of heathen coming into the church. I even heard Billy Graham talk about this one time many years ago. Billy Graham said that, that they had such a, a crusade. That's what they called the Catholics. Catholics called it a crusade. They would go out here and force people into the Catholic church. And these people say, okay, okay, don't kill us. We'll become Catholics. But they didn't know, they didn't know who Jesus was. They weren't saved. They weren't converted. They weren't begotten by the Holy Spirit, or to use the term evangelicals use, they weren't born again. They just simply became uh, pro professing Christians, professing Catholics. But that's all they did. That's all they did. They weren't truly born again. They weren't saved. So the Gentiles inherited lies. Now, do we have a scripture that actually says that? Yeah, we do. Jeremiah 16 and verse 19. I'm going to read it to you. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write that down. Look it up in your own Bible. Look it up in the King James. I haven't read the new versions on this. The new versions sometimes even leave out whole verses, so you've got to be careful about that. But here in, in chapter 16 of Jeremiah, verse 19, O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. You know, that's good to know because we're in times of affliction and it's going to get worse before it gets better. But God is our refuge. The Gentiles, now, i tell you what, before I read that verse, maybe I should give you the context on this. The context is when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom on this earth. Um, let me back up a few verses to, uh, let's go, if, if you're with me here, look at verse 11. Then shall you say to them, because your fathers have forsaken me, it says the Lord have walked after other gods that served them and, and worshiped them and have forsaken me. Listen, and have not kept my law. They have not kept my law. This is God talking. They have done worse than your fathers. Verse 12, for behold, you walk everyone after the imagination of your evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore, I will cast you out of this land and God did within about 50 years of less than 50 years after this was written, God cast them out of the land. And there you shall serve other gods day and night where I will not show you favor. 
Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord leaves that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the day will come when they will say, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all lands where he has driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave them unto their fathers. Now, this is talking about the second coming. Your commentary should bear that out. And, and in prophecy, God will be getting ready to say, I'm getting ready to stomp you. Then a few verses down, he'll say, but I'm eventually going to bring you back into the land. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they'll fish them. And I'll send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every high hill, and out of the holes and out of the rocks. For my eyes are upon all their ways. They are not here from my face. Now, first, verse 18, I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Because they have defiled my land, they have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. They're idols. And yet, over and over, if you read Isaiah, especially if you read Ezekiel, it talks about that before Christ really gets the millennium, the millennial kingdom going, he's going to bring back all of Israel back into the promised land. Now, a handful of Jewish people have gone over there already. But the Bible says the regathering takes place when the Messiah sets up his kingdom. One of the very first things on his agenda is to search and look for all the 13 tribes, or is it technically 13, and bring them all back into the promised land. And they're scattered everywhere. There, there are some in Egypt, there are some in Europe, there are some here in America, but God is going to find, and there may be millions and millions. Some people think that maybe all the Anglo-Saxons may be descended from them, and that's a very good possibility when you look at the, the history of that, of that theory. And so whoever they are, God's going to bring them all back into the land, not just Jewish people. The Jews are one-thirteenth of Israel. He's bringing all the tribes back into the land. Now, when that happens, what, what does the Bible say in Revelation 20, verse 3? The devil will be bound after he brings them back in. Then well, it's after he brings them back then is when Russia attacks Israel. That's Ezekiel 37 when he brings them back into the land. And then 38 and 39 when Russia comes down and attacks all the tribes of Israel because they'll have neither bars nor gates because Jesus Christ will be there in person. And so then Jesus himself will defeat that Russian army, which is something like 200 million. It's not just Russia. It's Russia allied with Libya. Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Tugarma, and Gomer, very likely maybe with China, but all these different, uh, we don't know China for sure, but it talks about the hordes of the east. All these people make up an army of 200 million, and they come down into Palestine in order to dest destroy Israel and get a warm water port there on the Mediterranean. And they ha it says they'll have no bars or gates, they'll have no defenses, they'll have no walls. Now, a wall to any nation is its defense, its navy, its air force. That's our wall. Not a literal wall of brick and mortar, but a literal, but a wall of defense. They'll have no wall whatsoever. Today, they have a very good one. They have one of the world's best air forces, I understand. Very good air force. But at that time, they won't have anything. And so they will cry out to their king, Jesus Christ. And he personally will wipe them out. You can read about that in Zechariah 14. I don't know what the verses are, something like verses 10 through maybe 15, something like that. And it talks about all these nations who come down against Jerusalem. He said, while they stand on their feet, their flesh will consume away, their eyes will consume away in their sockets. While they stand on their feet, God's going to kill them. Now, he won't totally just disintegrate them. There'll be bodies because it's going to take seven months to bury the bodies, seven years to burn their war implements. Seven months just to bury the bodies. An amazing thing. Now, after that, the devil will then be put away. And then the Gentiles, it says in Micah, that all the nations will come to Jerusalem to learn God's law. Now, listen to what it says. I'm finally coming now to verse 19. Jeremiah 16, verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, they are going to come to thee, Jesus. Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity. And in the Hebrew word vanity means emptiness. And things wherein there is no profit. There is no profit. The Gentiles will finally realize our fathers have inherited a bunch of lies. Should we be lying to our children and say there's this big guy at the North Pole wearing a red suit who comes down every Christmas and drops 
presents down the chimney or whatever it is they do. I asked my daddy when I was a little boy, I said, we don't have a chimney. How does Santa Claus get in the house? I wanted to know. My daddy grinned from ear to ear. He said, he's got ways. Well, when you're a little kid, you believe whatever your parents tell you. But our, our families have inherited lies. The idea that Christ was born in December is a lie. Now, I'm not saying that pastors are lying if they really don't know better, but I don't know that I have met a pastor that really didn't know better, especially if they went to seminary, they learned this. <clears throat> the Good Friday, Easter, Sunday tradition is a lie. Jesus didn't die on Good Friday, and he didn't rise on Sunday morning. That's a lie. The bunnies and the rabbits and the eggs all come from ancient Babylon. Do a study. Now, if you just go into your web browser on your computer and just write the word Easter, you get all kinds of nice sentimental stuff from Catholics. But put the word pagan in front of the word Easter and look at all the hundreds and hundreds of pages that will come up showing you the true origin of the Easter festival, which, again, the Catholics said, well... We can't get these people to stop celebrating it. Let's come up with some kind of a Christian significance for this holiday. So they did. Now, if you and I lived in Thailand, where Buddhism is a big, big religion, or some of the other nations where Buddhism is prevalent, you would have the Buddhist festival called the Wisak Festival, where they're celebrating the birthday of Buddha. Now, as Christians, you and I would not celebrate that. But what if, all, what if we had thousands of people coming into the church, and they just didn't want to give it up? I suppose we could say, well, you know, let's take the Wiesak Festival and let's just convert it into a Christian festival. I believe it's at that festival, I'm pretty sure it is, where they are allowed to throw their priest into the mud. That's part of the celebration. They grab their priest and throw them into the mud. Can we do that part? No, you can't do that part. <laughs> but we could say, well, we'll just adopt that for our church. And But, but how, what are we going to make it? Well, let's make it the birthday of Jesus. That'd be good. Or we can make it the birthday of St. John the Baptist or somebody like that. You could come up with some kind of Christian significance. But does that please God to borrow from the pagan and then give it Christian significance? No, it doesn't. Historians and all scholars know the truth, but they just go with the flow. So let me talk about something that is actually a little nicer now that I've really insulted you and offended you very, very well now, as well as hundreds of people watching around the world, now that I've offended everybody. Now let me talk about why people enjoy this holiday season. Let's talk about that. Number one, I tried to come up with as many different ideas as I could. Maybe some of you can come up with other ideas. Number one, they like the decorations. They enjoy decorating their house. They enjoy looking at the decorations, and they're pretty. I, I don't mind driving down the street looking at Christmas lights. I enjoy looking at them. Some years ago, uh, my lady friend, whose eyesight was as bad as mine, at that time I had myopia and I had to wear glasses to see far away. Now I don't have to, but at the time I did. And she and I could exchange glasses, and I could see out of her glasses fine. So I knew that we had the same vision. Well, we went with uh, another couple, I think it was, down to uh, Heritage USA down in South Carolina. And they had this great big water tower dressed like an angel, not dressed, <laughs> decorated like an angel with all these lights. And uh, it looked pretty. And I took my glasses off and said, wow. I said, hey, take your glasses off. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, wow, that's beautiful. It looked great with your glasses off because it was all fuzzy. And I mean, we saw things that the ordinary person didn't see because our eyesight was bad. <laughs> so decorations are not bad. But where do decorations come from? from uh, a book called Every Man's Encyclopedia, page 1672, comes a statement here. The practice of decorating houses and churches near December 25th is pagan in its origin. It was something they did to honor the sun god. Now you might say, but we don't do it to honor the sun god, but there again, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God says. Interesting. That, that goes back to an ancient pagan custom in honor of the pagan sun god. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, it does talk about that. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I have some more to say about that. Another thing that is done at this time is gift giving or exchanging of gifts. Now, kids love to go and sit on Santa Claus' lap. And, yeah, you know, I know it's fun for the parents to watch the kids open up their gifts. Do you know if you could do that any time of year? You wouldn't have to do it in connection with a religious festival that came out of Babylon. 
and then it was moved to Rome, and then it was all over Europe. You don't have to do that. You could, you could do it at their birthday. You could do it at the Feast of Tabernacles. You could buy gifts for your kids and just have a ball doing it. You don't have to do it in honor of a pagan holiday. And I have known of people who not only bought gifts with their cash, but they, they didn't have the money, so they put it on their credit card. And one lady told me, she says, my husband is still paying for those Christmas gifts all the way into March. And by October, you got to start buying again. Because in October, here it comes again. I mean, it's bondage that the average family is, is in. And I feel sorry for people who celebrate it because you're not going to get a Christmas card from me this year. I won't spend one penny on it. It's not, it doesn't honor Jesus, and I'm not going to participate in it. Now, there's a lot of Christians now that are beginning to see these things. I'm not the only one. Well, where did, where did this idea of gift exchanging come from? Let me read you another quotation here. This comes from, what, this is from, the, this is from a book called A Treasury of Christmas, page 59, page 25 on this one. Now, even the gift-giving tradition goes back to ancient pagan, pre-Christian customs in honor of pagan gods. Um, no, wait a minute, wrong book. This one, I got so many books here that I got quoted from. This one is the Christmas and its Customs. This is a different author. Um, quote, because gift-giving was so essential a part of the pagan celebrations, that's their word, pagan celebrations, meaning of the Saturnalia, the early church frowned upon it. The early church frowned upon exchanging of gifts at this time because it was part of the pagans, <clears throat> as sternly as upon other and more questionable New Year celebrations. So they, they frowned upon this type of thing and did not like it, didn't go for it at all. What's another thing, though, that, that families like to do at this time? Well, they like to get together with their relatives. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong, there's nothing sinful, even at this time of the year, to get together with family. That's when families get together. And anytime you can get together with your, your aunts and your uncles and your cousins and your nieces and your nephews and your parents, if, if they're still living, by all means, get together with your family and enjoy your family. There's nothing wrong with that anytime. Because, you know, one day you won't have them. Uh, that, that eventually will stop. When I was a kid, or when I was a teenager, uh, our, my mother was one of 14 kids. We had great big groups, you know, people getting together. And, and, but they'd always do it at Christmas time. They called it a Christmas party. Uh, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with get, getting together with family at that time. So that's one of the things that people like about Christmas. Now, they like the decorations. I can look at them and enjoy them, and it doesn't cost me anything to look at them. As far as the gift exchanging, I don't do that. I don't receive gifts. I don't give gifts. I tell people, don't give anything because I don't reciprocate. Number three, families get together. That's a good thing. Here's another thing people like at this time of the year. Beautiful music. It's the only time you ever get to hear Bing Crosby anymore. If it wasn't for Christmas, people wouldn't know who Bing Crosby was. And there are people in their 20s and 30s that don't know who Bing Crosby is because he's, he's been dead now for so long. But beware of things like Silent Night, which pictures the Messiah, the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords, God of heaven, as a helpless little baby in a manger. Because you see, the devil knows psychology. If the devil can keep that, that picture in your mind of this helpless little baby in a diaper laid in a manger, it takes away from the greatness and the power of Jesus Christ. If we're going to picture Jesus, we ought to picture him. The way the Bible does in Revelation chapter 1. His face shines like the sun. His hair is white like wool. Just brilliant radiance. Power emanating from his body. Hmm? Like a lion in a way in the manger. Says, oh, the poor baby lay. Is, is that what it says? Yes. The poor baby lay. I didn't know that was in that song. Mm -hmm. I haven't sung it in 50 years, so I didn't know. About 50 years now. So, but now, you know, Jingle Bells is really not a, a religious song. Jingle Bells just say, hey, let's go out and ride in a sleigh with, and let a horse pull it. I have not yet done that. But if I have the opportunity, I would do it. Love to ride in an, an open, what is it called? A, one, horse. one horse open sleigh, is that what it is? There are things like that. But why don't they say that in January, too? Because January is when we have our snow, not December. So a lot of these songs uh, are put together around the time of the holidays. And yet had, that one has nothing to do. But avoid Silent Night, which pictures Jesus as a helpless little baby. Poor little baby, huh? Yeah, see, that, that's the devil's way of sneaking it in on you, this idea that Christ is helpless. The Catholics, <coughs> about the only time they, they picture him is either as a helpless baby or a dead Christ hanging on the cross. This is called a crucifix. 
And a dead person can't help you either. Don't, that, that's why God said don't mess with these idols. Don't have graven images of God because you'll, it's going to hurt your religion. So here's the thing. Keep Christ out of the celebration. Don't mess with the celebration. Leave it alone. And yet I see these signs on the church marquees. Jesus is the reason for the season. That's a lie of Satan the devil. He has nothing to do with it. He's not the reason for it. It's the winter solstice is the whole reason for it. Now I make people mad. You know, I could get a job like some pastors have making a six-figure income in a great big church. I could do it. I'm sure I could. I've got a doctorate from a Baptist school anyway. I have a master's and a doctorate. I could do it. But when I get and preach this, how long will I last? I can't go there and preach the Bible because I'll get thrown out. I'm used to getting thrown out anyway. So it wouldn't be a big problem, but I wouldn't last too long. If I only give them milk, I might last. So here's the thing. Jesus is not the reason for the season. And everybody who says that, they're perpetuating a lie. I'm not calling them liars. Maybe they don't know, but they're perpetuating a lie. They're either lying themselves or they're abysmally ignorant. Number five, another reason people like this time of the year is because of the holiday cheer, the tinsel joy, and that's fabricated by Hollywood. People seem to be nicer this time of the year. People are more generous. They, they call on you. Would you please help the poor? Are the poor only poor in December? Help the hungry. Are they only hungry in December? What about January? They, they stop ringing the bells at the, at the department stores, you know. In January, they just do it because they think this is a good time to pick your pocket because you're going to tend to be more generous. Have you watched the Hallmark TV movies? <laughs> I've seen a few of them. And it's nothing about Jesus. It's all about this time of year. We should be peaceful. We should have loving thoughts. This time of year is a time of peace and joy. But they never mention Christ. So do you know there are more suicides in December? Than in most months of the year, if it, I think it's got the highest, the highest suicide rate. It's got the highest homicide rate too. People hear all the songs, and the devil is so sneaky. He's clever. That song "I'll Be Home for Christmas" such a sad song. How many people are are, are away from home and can't be with their family, and they hear those tear jerking songs, and people get very, very, very depressed. Because why is everybody so happy but me? Why is everybody so joyful but me? And they watch the TV shows, you know, where everybody's so happy and they're all singing, drinking the eggnog and all that stuff around the piano at Christmas time. But I'm not doing that. I mean, that's what they're thinking. I'm not doing that. Or what about soldiers out in another country or something? Christmas is an extremely depressing time of the year. I mean, let's be realistic. It is very depressing. Because they think they're supposed to be happy and they're not. But holiday cheer is one of the reasons people like it. A sixth reason is people love the holiday candy, the baking, the cookies. And again, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't overdo it. And then the seventh one I've got here is holiday parties. People like to, have, like to party. And it's an excuse to party. Is it wrong to party? As long as it doesn't violate God's law, well, it's not wrong to party. But then again, you know, they take the mistletoe and they put it up on the tree and they say, come over here. And they, that's the only time they can legally kiss their neighbor's wife if they do it at Christmas time because they're standing under the mistletoe. It's a way to sneak in a kiss that you couldn't do in June or July. Hmm. Well, that's uh, getting into something else. So holiday cheer. Roger Humber, the director of the Criminal Justice Department at South University in Montgomery, stated that, and I'm quoting now this from the Internet. This is some research I did last evening. Crimes such as theft arise as a result of people's increased financial needs during the holidays. And this quotation, crimes such as assault and domestic violence tend to increase because of the added stresses of the season and often involving drugs and alcohol, tend to rise because of an increase in celebrations during the season. Hmm. Now this came from the internet. Number one, this, these are actual quotations. I didn't write this. I just got this last night, just before 6 p.m. Christmas supposedly marks the birth of Jesus on December 25th, but there is no mention of December 25th in the Bible. I didn't write this. This is a quotation, not from a religious site, from a historical site about Christmas. 
December 25th was probably chosen because it coincided with the ancient pagan festival Saturnalia, which celebrated the agricultural god Saturn with partying, gambling, and gift giving. Riotous, riotous heathen celebrations. The next one, many of the popular Christmas traditions today found their roots in Saturnalia. Branches from evergreen trees were used during winter solstice as a reminder of the green plants that would grow in spring when the sun gods grew strong. It was in honor of the sun gods. Next one, these evergreen branches became the foundation of our Christmas tree. Germans are thought to be the first to bring Christmas trees into their homes of the holidays and to decorate them with cookies and lights. Next one, the well-known reason we give presents at Christmas is, is to symbolize the gifts given to the baby Jesus by the three wise men, but it may also stem from the Saturnalia tradition that required revelers to offer up rituals to their gods. That's the actual thing. Because remember, the wise men didn't come there in December. They came two years later when Jesus was about two years old. We don't know what time of the year that would have been. The last one here, because of its roots in pagan festivals, Christmas was not immediately accepted by the religious. In fact, from 1659 to 1681, it was illegal to celebrate Christmas in Boston, Massachusetts. You were fined if you were caught celebrating. They said, that's a pagan sin. We're a Christian nation. You don't do that. It's pagan. There's a show on um, like History Channel or Smithsonian Channel, one called um, America History Fact or Fiction. And they did a whole um, episode about Christmas. And they said that, that Christmas used to be illegal in America. Yeah, yeah. Because of how debaucherous it was. It was, yeah, terrible. I want you to go with me to a few things in the Bible. We're going to conclude with these scriptures here. Let's find out what God says about this. Uh, I want to first of all go to, uh, let's go to Leviticus 18. And if you don't have time to look them up, just write these down. And look them up later for your own personal Bible study. Leviticus 18 and verse 3. Jesus said, live by every word of God. So why don't we start living by every word of God? Let's make that commitment to do that today. Leviticus 18, verses 3 through 5. After, now, God is bringing Israel into the promised land where the heathen are. There are seven heathen nations that God says, wipe them out. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Verse 4, here's what you are to do. You shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I'm the Lord your God. Verse 5, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So don't do what they did. In Leviticus 20, and verse 22, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and my judgments. You'll find them in Exodus 21, 22, and 23. And do them, that the land where I bring you to dwell there and spew you not out, just like it was happening to the heathen. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things. Therefore, I abhorred them. Don't you do that. That's what God says. But I have said to you, verse 24, you shall inherit their land. I'll give it to you to possess. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from other people. God wants us to separate from these pagan traditions of the world. Verse 25, you shall therefore put difference between the clean beast and the unclean. Don't eat skunks, rats, and dogs, and cats. And between unclean fowls and clean, unclean fowls like buzzards and ravens, vultures of all kinds, bats, don't do that. <clears throat> Verse 26, and you shall be holy unto me, because I'm holy. You're to be holy to God, and don't do these things. And Deuteronomy chapter 12 Two books over, Deuteronomy chapter 12. And we'll conclude with these scriptures. So not just this one, but I got several more, but just when I finish these scriptures, that's how we'll conclude. We're not going to have any more quotations because I've got a bunch of them to give you, but I'm not going to take the time to do it today. But in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 2, you shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and the high hills and under every green tree. Destroy their places of worship. Destroy their temples. Now, the early Catholic Church followed this for a while. 
And then later, a pope came along and said, well, if, if it's a beautiful structure, let's sprinkle it with holy water and we'll call it a Christian church. So they took over the temples. These temples had great big, huge steeples on them. And that's why churches to this day, when they build a church, they got to have a steeple because that's what the pagan temples look like. And they got used to it. Verse 3, you shall overthrow their altars. Don't use their altars for the altar of Christ. And break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. You shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Listen, you shall not do so to the Lord your God. Don't you do to your God what they did to their gods. Don't even use the same buildings they're using. That's interesting. Verse 30, take heed to yourself that thou be not snared by following them. Don't follow their customs. After that, they be destroyed from before you. And that you inquire not after their gods or after their religions, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? Even so, I will do likewise. Now, that could mean one of two things. One, how did they serve their gods? I'll, I'll do likewise and serve their gods. Or it could mean, how did these nations serve their gods? I'll do likewise to the true God. Now, let's see what the interpretation is. Verse 31, thou shalt not do so to the Lord thy God. Don't you worship the true God the same way the pagans worship their gods. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates have they done to their gods. Verse 32, whatever I tell you to do, do it. Listen, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish, take away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9. Are you having a good time today? Have I, are you getting ready to throw stones at me now? Oh, oh don't just read the Bible. That'll get you in trouble for sure. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord your God shall give you, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Oh, but we're worshiping the true God. Doesn't matter. Don't do after their customs. Don't do that. Then he talks about people who use divination, observing of times, and so all that, all these things. Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, he said, I, I'm driving them out from before you. Verse 13, you shall be perfect with the Lord your God. You be perfect with him. Don't follow these heathen because they're not right with God. Now, I want to go to Proverbs chapter 30. You'll find that right after the book of Psalms. Proverbs 30. And verse 5, every word of God is pure. That's why we should live by every word of God. Jesus said, Luke 4, 4, live by every word of God. The NIV took that out, by the way. He is a shield to them that put their trust in him. Add thou not to his words. Don't add to God's words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Well, Jesus was born in December. That's, he might reprove you for being a liar. Don't add to God's words. Now I want to go to Jeremiah 10, which... Nathan brought up a few moments ago. You got Isaiah, then you have Jeremiah, and in chapter 10 it says, verse 1, hear the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaks to you. Verse 2, thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven, because the heathen are dismayed. Verse 3, for the customs of the people are vain. One cuts a tree out of the forest. If you cut it out of the forest, what do you do with it? They brought it back to their house. I used to do that as a kid. My dad and I would go out with an ax. That was before the days of chainsaws, I guess. And we would find us just the perfect Christmas tree, chop it down, bring it in the house, you know, kill the tree, beautiful tree, take it inside and kill it, and set it up so that it wouldn't fall. And then we'd put gifts at the bottom of that tree. God said, they deck it with silver and gold, verse 4, so they, they, they would decorate it. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it moved not. We had a, 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 a little, like a little tripod or something, the thing would sit on so it wouldn't fall over. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Don't be afraid of them. You say, oh, but that's talking about an idol. Yeah, it is. Do you know what the origin of the, the, the real origin of the Christmas tree is? It actually goes back to the Yule log when Nimrod and the customs of involving the sun god Tammuz of Babylon, they had a dead log that according to Babylonian tradition, came to life overnight and an evergreen tree sprung from that dead log, the Yule log. So naturally, they laid gifts at the feet of that tree in honor of worship of Nimrod or Tammuz. 
Nimrod is the name found in the Bible. There really was such a man as Nimrod. And when he died, he became the sun god of Babylon. You can read about this in Alexander, Dr. Alexander Hislop's history called the Two Babylons, which you won't find in your Christian bookstore, but they can order it for you. The Catholics don't like for you to have that in, your, in, in the bookstore. But it's, it's all there. Now let's go to Ezekiel. Next book over. Just a few more scriptures. Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 12. And you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments. But here's what you've done. You've done after the manners of the heathen. You've followed the manners of the heathen. Don't do that. Look at chapter 20 of Ezekiel. And verse 31. When you offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, which was a pagan custom, you pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall I be inquired by you? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of you. Verse 32, and that which comes into your mind shall not be at all that you say, we will be as the heathen. We want to be just like the heathen, as the families of the countries. But what does God mean? Are you going to do all this and then you want me to be inquired of you? In other words, you'll do all this paganism, but then you'll come into the true temple which stood in that day. They'll come into the temple of God and they'll pray to the God of Israel. They'll pray to the God of Abraham. They'll pray to the God whom we know in the New Testament as Jesus Christ. But at the same time, they're doing all these heathen customs, which God forbids us to do. Interesting. Chapter um, 23, two pages over. Chapter 23 of Ezekiel, verse 35. Because thus says the Lord God, therefore thus says the Lord God, because you've forgotten me. And you've cast me behind your back. Therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. Verse 37. Have they committed adultery and blood in their hands and with their idols? Now the adultery here is not talking about physical adultery. It means they have, they're married to God. Jeremiah 3.14, God says, I'm married to you. Talking to Israel. And yet they were worshiping other gods, which is like a married woman having something to do with another man. So it's spiritually speaking, it's considered to be adultery. Verse 38, moreover, this they've done unto me. They've defiled my sanctuary. The temple was still there, but they had defiled it. In the same day, and they've profaned my Sabbaths, plural, not just weekly, but annual as well. And where they had slain their children to their idols, they have slain their own kids. Now, the idol today, watch any Hollywood program, watch TV shows, don't watch them. But, I mean, if you do, what, what, like, what is that, two men and a half? I've never watched it. Two and a half men. But I've watched 30 seconds here and 30 seconds there, and you can just turn on any time it's about sex. The big idol today in America is sexual licentiousness. And people have, the reason they want abortion legal, the reason the Democrats especially are pushing abortion, is not just because they want the right to kill their children. But if they have the right to abortion, that gives them the right to live sexually any way they want to, and that's a woman's right. According to the to the leftists in this country, that's a woman's right. So the only way a woman can exercise her right to, to, to sleep around with all these different men is you got to let them have abortion because eventually they're going to get pregnant. So abortion is kind of a side issue. The real woman's right they don't want to be denied is sexual freedom. Have all the sexual freedom you want to. So God says they have slain their children to their idols today of sex. Then they came the same day into my sanctuary they still go into church. And lo, they have done this in the midst of my house. And furthermore, that you have sent, verse 4, you've sent men to come from far unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came. Then he talks about all the things they had done. God says he doesn't want us messing with that. Now, let me give you two more scriptures and we will conclude. Does the New Testament have anything to say about not being like the heathen? Let me give you two more scriptures. Matthew chapter 6. Red letters. Jesus is speaking here. So if you don't believe me, that's fine. You haven't missed anything. If you don't believe me, unless I'm telling you the truth, of course. But will you believe Jesus? Now, if you don't claim to be a Christian, this doesn't mean a thing. But if you claim to be a Christian, you better listen to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. 
Chapter 6, verse 7. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Well, what's wrong with that? Don't be like the heathen. Look at verse 8, the first line. Be not you therefore likened to them. Don't you be like the heathen. That's Jesus talking. Now, you can ignore me all you want to, and that's fine. But if you ignore Jesus, he's your judge. I'm not your judge. Thank God I'm not. I don't want to be anybody's judge. But in John chapter 5, Jesus said, all judgment has been given to me. God gave Jesus all judgment. So he will judge you and you and you and me and everybody watching. Everybody will someday, Romans 14 says, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. Everybody will stand before his judgment seat. I'm glad you won't stand before me. But you will stand before him. Jesus, your judge, says, don't be like them. Don't be like them. One more scripture. Mark chapter 7. Red letters again. Oh, but, but my church, we believe, you know, that's the reason you believe, because you're following your church and you're not following Christ. But my family says, yeah, and you're following your family and you're not following Christ. You see now why I don't preach at a great big church. I couldn't last very long doing this. Chapter 7, of, and I appreciate all of you being here. Mark 7 and verse 6. Well, has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites? Ooh. Now, a hypocrite is somebody who puts on a face. That's what the word hypocrite in Greek means. He's wearing a mask. He puts on a face. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. Oh, how I love Jesus that I won't keep his commandments. How bid in vain do they worship me? Do you know it's possible to worship Jesus Christ and do it all in vain? Why? Why? What type of worship makes, what is it that you do in your worship that makes it all vain? In vain do they worship me? Here's why. Teaching for their doctrines, for their church doctrines, the commandments of men. Christmas became an order by the Catholic Church in the 5th century. It's a commandment of men. People say, oh, but this is being picky. What difference does it matter? As long as we celebrate his birthday. All right? In order not to be a hypocrite, I de-double dare you to celebrate his birthday in September, which is not pagan. There's nothing pagan about his birthday. But December 25th is not his birthday. So I de-double dare you to get your family together and have a big a big birthday party in September. Get on your knees and praise him and worship him. That's fine. I'm not saying it's wrong to honor his birthday, but do it in September. If you do it in December, you're doing it at the time of the winter solstice. And some people say, well, that's when he was begotten. Nobody celebrates a person's begettal. We celebrate their birth. It's an excuse, though, to be like the heathen and have something going on with the heathen, with the time going on with the heathen to it. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God, you, the ones he calls hypocrites, you hold the tradition of men. You're holding that tradition. You're hanging on to this tradition. Verse 9, full well, you reject the commandment of God that you may hold your own tradition. Verse 13, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition. And that's what we have in the December 25th celebration. God said don't participate in customs originating with the heathen, customs that were owned by the heathen. Don't use them to honor Christ. Use God's festivals to honor Christ. Don't mix paganism and Christianity together. Don't mix it. You say, I'm not. Yeah, but you're following churches that, that have done so for centuries. Don't use them to honor Christ. Don't mix heathen doctrines with the true religion of the Bible. Just do what he said, Deuteronomy 12, 32. What I tell you to do, do it. Don't add thereto. Don't take away from it. Now that I've made you all mad, does anybody have any questions? And now I'll give you the floor. Good to see you, Kirk. Hey, yeah, I just uh, participated in a uh, prayer walk with an organization called Love Life Charlotte. Mm -hmm. It's a young man, businessman that had a burden for uh, the abortion that was going on. Yeah. Right, right. The other side was there. Right? Oh, 
Yeah. Mar March was part of an abortion clinic, the largest in Charlotte, privately owned. Mm -hmm. It does about 8,000 abortions a year. Uh, this was on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. it was by a, a, a private uh, person. Yeah. And uh, the statistics are that 73% of abortions in this country are, are performed on women who profess to be Christian. Wow. Okay. So, let me let me reiterate that for our audience here. Seventy three percent of all abortions done are, are are done on people who profess to be Christians. Yeah. Seventy three percent are Christians. Which I would thought I found was really shocking, but that speaks to the compromise that you know the, the church has bought into yeah. this modern day mm -hmm. um, liberalism that you talked about. Mm -hmm. That they bought into. It. Yeah, I think. And women don't have. Yeah, they think it's nothing wrong with it. The churches have been heavily influenced by the culture of the age. That's why they're now ordaining homosexuals and saying, well, there's nothing wrong with ordaining them or even marrying two men together and let them wallow around the bed of filth together. They think there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't condemn the sinner, but, I, but what I do condemn, <clears throat> and I attack the churches that permit and tolerate this kind of thing. I feel sorry for the homosexual. I've got nothing but pity for them because I feel sorry for them. But the church is no better. And, and God is going to judge them for doing that kind of thing. And 73% of Christian women, or, th or the people that get abortions of that number, 73% are Christian women. Thank you. I think I interrupted you. Did you have more to say? Uh, no, I mean, it was just, it was amazing to just be a part of that. And yeah. so that particular day, we saw, I think it was 25 women mm -hmm. inside of the Trace Life. Great. That came into... Our crowd, which, yeah. you know, the, the, they give them a uh, free ultrasound, mm -hmm. uh, free baby doctor here in Charlotte that delivers the baby. Wow. They give them housing. I mean, it's just. It's, That's great. Yeah. So you saved uh, 25 babies. 25 babies. And one day? Yeah, on Saturday. Wow. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, during that week. During that week, the yeah. The march was all week, but the culmination was on Saturday. Wow. So for that week, yeah. 25. And, and that, why that's great news, there's obviously those that had abortions. Yeah. yeah. But um, Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 says that God knew us mm -hmm. in the matrix of yeah. our mother's womb. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you parallel that to when um, Mary got her word that she was going to be pregnant, it's about three months, the angel of the Lord actually hovered over her. Before she was impregnated, the Bible says. So, in the Jewish belief system, uh, whenever someone is going to be pregnant, they believe that in the spirit, God actually, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, that's the matrix. In other words, that is, God actually forms his image of us before the pregnancy even takes place. Yeah, interesting. So, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, they say 25. Lives that week. Yeah, this great. is a young man that, that, that mm. uh, named Kevin that has a car wash business, mm -hmm. and he, God put a burden with him and his wife. Yeah, and there's 150 churches now that are behind this movement. They're going to open up Woodford Vale and Raleigh. He's got a national a vision to take this national. That's great. That's so, great. Yeah. And yeah, you're hurting the the abortion business. You know, you're you're taking money from their pockets. Yeah. Well, in some states, there's only <laughs> one abortion clinic in the whole state. Wow. Like in the whole state of Montana, there's like only one abortion clinic. So it's having its, not this particular ministry, yeah. but the whole movement yeah. is having its impact. And of course, we have a conservative, yeah. you know, president. Yeah, we have a conservative country. president, so maybe we can get rid of abortion. I would love to see that overturned. If any president can do it, this old boy can. I saw him, I saw him talking last night on television. I could hardly turn it off, but I had to go to bed. But I mean, he was really going strong. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I like the fact that he made Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that that is a, a spiritual as well as a political? It, it could be. Uh, it might uh, even facilitate the the building of the temple now. Finally, it might. I don't know. It won't hurt that we moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to the real capital, which is Jerusalem. And and a lot of the the Democrats were saying, well, it's going to upset the Arabs. Everything upsets the Arabs. The Arabs are already upset. They stay upset. So, what's new? Well, for those of you who are watching, thank you very much. I want to welcome our international audience. Thank you. Tell other people where they can watch this. They may not agree with it, but at least they will not be bored with what they hear.
We're dismissed. Nathan, we'll see you.